For those of you who don't know me, is Anne Marie <laughs> Walters. I'm the Industry Marketing Director for Bentley Systems and the liaison here with uh, the ARC organisation. It is my great pleasure to introduce our CEO to speak to you this afternoon. I'd also like to point out for the first time here at ARC, and for many of you who probably don't know her but know her name, we have Christine B Byrne from our PR organisation stood at the back there. So if you haven't met her before, that, that's who she is. And she has our annual report for those of you who don't know who we are and our year in infrastructure book as well. But without further ado, I'll hand over to Greg. Many thanks to Anne-Marie and thanks to each of you for your interest in asset performance modeling. So ARC's uh, mandate for us this year, a new age of innovation. Here's the marching orders from ARC having to do with convergence. I think there's even more convergence than that. And if so, could we hold ourselves to the standard if there's a new age of innovation of attracting and appealing to digital natives, our next generation? See what you think. So Bentley Systems is new to some of you. To how many is, is Bentley Systems new? Uh, so we have our, some annual reports there from 2014. In two th we don't have a 2015 annual, re annual report yet. We filed to go public as a company after 30 years. The annual report tells our 30-year history, so I'm not going to do it now. We're still waiting for a congenial public market, but we're <laughs> philosophical. <laughs> 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 and it gets further away by the day, but that's okay. We've been at it for, uh, for 30 years. Uh, our endeavor to advance BIM, you may have heard of BIM. Our way of defining it is at the same time, uh, we seek to improve project delivery and to have better asset performance. And in the case of project <coughs> delivery, better is achieved through greater breadth, breadth of information mobility and through for a better asset performance the BIM, better depth of information modeling. We endeavor to make advancements on both axes at the same time. So you can say we start with CapEx, but focus at the same time on OpEx, because it's all about yeah. TOTEX. <laughs> and wouldn't we like the TOTE to be X as we improve value and asset performance. <laughs> That's something that we feel uniquely able to work on at Bentley Systems by virtue over our 30 years. We started with microstation and applications for information modeling and our collaboration environment project-wise for integrated projects to yield <coughs> intelligent infrastructure <coughs> supported by our asset-wise services. And the opportunity is for digital engineering models created at this stage to converge to pay off for the owners in intelligent infrastructure. These are our Bentley applications to support infrastructure assets as we term them, everything that's built to improve the world. The blue ones are applications that are new over the course of the past year. So our applications create the digital engineering models uh, for our infrastructure in the world. And ARC, uh, we respect very much the uh, market rankings. We are number two overall for engineering design tools for plant and infrastructure, and number one in many categories of interest to you and your readers, but also uh, in terms of asset reliability software, number two overall and number one in many relevant markets as we work on both those axes. And here today, you have, uh, in terms of asset performance management, uh, something we released in November, describing the latest release of our asset performance management software uh, to, to better serve risk-based inspection and work better with SAP and so forth. Uh, we annually uh, award, be inspired awards for our users' projects 2014 Innovation and Asset Performance uh, finalist was the Malaysian power company. I visited there uh, last spring, and we got an award uh, for their improved asset performance from the CEO of Kanaga. We publish each year in our infrastructure yearbook, and you have that to take away today, hot off the press, but you've perhaps been looking at the digital copies, the uh, projects nominated and awarded each year at our Year in Infrastructure Conference. And how many join us in London for that, for that conference? You are all invited 
Uh, it will be there again this November. When I was here a year ago, I announced our acquisition of Amulet in operational analytics, serving many sectors of interest. And since then, Gartner, who keeps track for, as they say, asset <coughs> performance management, have uh, reckoned us as capable uh, as any, and including the next uh, General Electric, we know how hard and effectively they work on the industrial internet of things, so we accept the challenge to go further even, and one of the users of Amulet has put it all together uh, for operational analytics. It started actually in Adelaide with this desalination plant that they built during their long drought. Its design won our Be Inspired Award in 2009. So they had great digital engineering models when uh, two years ago they were ready to operate the plant. And so they pulled together the following accomplishment for converging IT, OT, and these digital engineering models for ET. They won the Global Water Performance Initiative of the year 2014 and were our winner uh, last year. So I'm going to let them tell that story a bit. In South Australia, SA Water has introduced predictive and real-time operational analytics through Bentley's Amulet software, improving customer service while reducing operating costs. I think the, the tools we've developed here are uh, uh, an example of the sorts of things that will be very common in the future in, in uh, industry, especially industry with large asset bases where you've got complex things to operate. It allows you to take uh, a variety of inputs and, and, and make the best possible decision. In our case, we've got some sophisticated optimizers we use that uh, Amulet sits around and it makes a big difference to the way we organize the network and, and how, how effectively we can operate. The scope of the inputs he's talking about, the diverse inputs, are for the first time with Amulet, we can bring in environmental inputs, the weather, which is key to their, uh, to South Australia Water's uh, uh, demand, and their network operations model reflects their engineering technology, the digital engineering models, by which they can treat their plant and reservoirs, in effect, as a a uh, huge pump storage opportunity with which to optimize not only their operations but their electricity consumption and have visibility across their network and plants as you see here to pull together and this is their presentation <coughs> the, the last aspect of it is to tie it in with the actual forward market for buying electricity which is priced per time of day and is very volatile in Australia and that closes the loop on the savings in TODEX that they achieve through this convergence. I've gone very quickly through that story because it's been reported by Gartner and you can see that lessons for integrating IT and OT with ET from their successful operational intelligence system. So asset performance monitoring uh, it, it, there's a lot of headway we make in the industrial internet of things by connecting our real-time inputs with librarians and databases and transactions of, of history. But, uh, and when we do that, we can uh, have <coughs> big data computing work hard enough to discern patterns and respond to them. But, what if we could also consider the operating baseline for our infrastructure assets, the digital engineering models that were the work of the engineers in the first place. And they take these forms, schematics and 3D models, catalogs and functional components, analyses, network models, that they're, they're, you might say, inscrutable to start with, but we've created those di digital engineering models or we understand the software that has done so and we can make those digital engineering models, if you like, the digital DNA for each of these assets. So you might say we advance today with individual health. We can have our own 
uh, monitoring of our, of our health so that when we would go to the doctor, the doctor wouldn't just compare our blood pressure to everybody else's blood pressure, but to our own history of our blood pressure. That, that's where we are with the industrial internet of things today, perhaps. But suppose that the doctor could have access to our DNA. We know that lies ahead in the future. The genome is not quite so simple. For our <coughs> infrastructure assets, we do have the DNA by which they were created. It's the engineer's work in our digital engineering tools. And those can form the <coughs> intelligent baseline. If we can put it together in the same fr frame of reference for what we're observing and operating, we can go from asset performance monitoring to asset performance modeling. And I think that really is the key to come to this industrial internet of things. And we have intelligent hardware of every sort for computing, for mobility, for <laughs> positioning, for imaging. Especially now we have UAVs and drones. It's the digital engineering models that can connect all that together <laughs> intelligently for the actions it would take for instance, I'm going to use the example of a substation because it's part of all industrial assets and we'd like to be able to go right into the asset performance history and, and, and failure modes uh, as here uh, and to be able, for instance, if we're looking at our substations over a territory to monitor where our alarms and events may occur and go right in through geo-coordination to the positioning within the infrastructure asset of where of what's causing the alarm and refer to their failure modes and the actual degradation we might observe in the field. If we could tie that all together, we make considerable perform uh, <coughs> progress. But is that for everyone? And how would we accomplish there? And can we get there? right now, and my premise is we have a great head start all of a sudden, because today we are converging OT and IT, and you might say, where are the digital engineering models? How do we complete that progress from monitoring to modeling? So that's the, that was the situation for Exelon, and we have a case study how they put together their asset performance management <coughs> approach to have health indexes for each of their assets in their T&D network. The, the problem was, when that became out of date, they said, how do we continuously update? Is there a way that we could always be up to date? And their subsidiary, ComEd, in fact, was the first during the past year to be approved to use drones, UAVs, to inspect their T&D assets. So I'd like to tell you about closing the loop here now, how something we call continuous surveying can create the frame of reference to, think, to bring the engineering models together with the operational models. So this is acute 3D software, which has been used for 3D city mapping from aerial photography to produce what is not a point cloud, but it's an actual 3D model, a mesh, from which you could, as in this case, look at the solar gain in a city. But when we uh, apply it industrially, we're using UAVs to take ordinary digital photographs or video, and from that, and those can be ordinary photographs with any of these devices, which our users tell us work better than they could possibly have imagined, even just from smartphones, to capture the context in a trackable 3D reality mesh that can provide this digital reference, digital frame of reference, because the digital engineering models are created by digital engineering tools in a digital engineering environment that is 3D. We actually operate our infrastructure in 3D. To bring the two together is now possible, not once and not occasionally like traditional survey, <coughs> but continuously each time we uh, extract digital photographs, for instance, from the UAVs that will be part of every plant maintenance fleet very shortly. And the key to it is what we call reality modeling software. So this is a substation in France just a few months ago. As you see, 286 images were taken from a drone, and then 180 from the ground, 
using even a cell phone. Might have been a little better camera, but doesn't have to be a great camera. And that created, this is a 3D mesh model. They supplemented it with some additional close range photography, for instance, to pick up those nameplates. And if you haven't been watching the flight of a drone, you've been navigating in the environment of the digital engineering models because this now is our microstation environment, the one in which engineers work with their design applications. And here, for instance, we can go about geo-coordinating positionally, for instance, from the nameplate. Now you'll see this is an actual mesh 3D model captured from, those, from the drone and ground photography. And we can attach or geo-coordinate, for instance, the maintenance manuals for that equipment. And I'm showing here now something that came to me just a couple days ago in our applied research group in Canada. This is an internal presentation. They're working to geo-coordinate the schematics, the PNIDs, where we know we always have up-to-date and correct PNIDs, but they're schematics, they're digital engineering models. If you put it together with the 3D model, and here my <coughs> colleagues created a mock-up of a plant in 3D to bring together the reality mesh from cameras with the schematic, with the 3D model, and are showing it in their offices with augmentation where you can walk through it immersively in virtual reality. Uh, that's how we do things to work it out so that we can be introducing these new age innovations uh, soon at industrial scale. And this, for instance, you can, you can be asked to find you were looking for the valve on the PNID that would turn something off for inspection. It can show you the way. So geo-coordination, how everything is put together positionally in the same 3D frame of reference captured from digital photography of the plant. So geo-coordination. And then next, we'd like to relate that to, for instance, the failure modes of that equipment, uh, which can be brought here and indexed to this 3D <coughs> operating model of the plant. And our software will put all of that together. And then our alarms and filters can be applied. Uh, these are examples from uh, Network Grid in the UK uh, of, for instance, for that transformer in a substation, what alarms and filters there can be, and configured uh, who's to be notified, for what purpose, when, but have this now part of this converged OT and IT and ET environment. And then you may use the drone in this case. This is a thermographic, not a photographic uh, record. These images of the thermography as well could be resolved into a 3D model uh, for early alarm conditions in that substation. And now I'd like to show what can be done with video uh, as a continuous survey. So this is a bridge that's instrumented, as you'll see, but it can be observed by video where the motion is magnified. These tricks are available in video now. It's conventionally censored. So OT is going strong here. But it turns out, this again is just our research, if you set up a video observation to produce this data, then in conjunction with the structural model <coughs> The original engineers work on that bridge. This is an actual bridge. Then, <coughs> compared to accelerometers, even if you censor the heck out of the bridge, they're a limited number. You can monitor as many points as you like in the video. And you end up solving for the modes of deflection and ultimately risk in the bridge. And the video has actually done a better job than the <coughs> conventional sensor of that bridge in understanding its structural characteristics, which could lead to alarms and filters. So deep learning it can be applied to video as well. In this case, 
uh, deep learning program watched an operator go through the video <coughs> of driving a roadway to learn when the operator clicked on a road sign. And then inventorying the road signs after just a couple hours of training, this program has done this very well. Imagine how much better it could from a 3D reality mesh model of your assets to help classify and link this converged environment together. So then in, the, in our substation, we're now back to engineering if we're modernizing that substation. Uh, we'll refer to our catalog of transformers, and this is the way in which work is done now in 3D and schematic mode together in our applications. But here we are in MicroStation, starting with the context of the actual reality mesh captured in that plant, and adding in our new engineering, <coughs> including new transformers, I guess, that is right in the context. So the acquired continuous survey model from the drone is the point of departure for the engineering of an upgrade to that substation. And why don't we harden it while we're at it? This is outside Paris with uh, new walls and lights. So then there's construction to follow. And we can fly our drone every couple days or a week. And here you see a way of presenting, and we could be doing this interactively, the condition in construction being different from one flight to the next. Imagine now that this could be done also during operations to monitor corrosion and so forth, where you're always aligned thanks to the reality mesh process. The benefit of surveying can now be continuous. So the conclusion, of course, is in the field where devices look like this now and are connected <coughs> and, and our latest software, everything is called the Connect Edition because we're the largest partner of Microsoft in using their Azure Cloud to tie everything together because this is where the result of operational insights pays off when you can navigate through that 3D model. It's the same 3D model, the same frame of reference, 3D, by which we work and we plan and we engineer. These are the devices of today. When you create a markup in the field, it's going to go back to the engineers, the maintenance engineers, the operational engineers, the design engineers, if need be, and be synchronized. And so that same app from Bentley Systems ships with the Microsoft Surface Hub, which is this touch <coughs> device you see here. And this would be synchronized in the office with what's being observed and corrected for asset performance modeling to pay off in the field. So our winner in advancing information mobility for operations this year was a project in Western Power, the largest transmission and distribution outfit in the UK with 3,500 iPads in the field. Each one of them has the entire network model uh, for uh, the largest portion of the UK, and only the changes are uh, transmitted through what we call delta changes in I models to connect and close that loop in the convergence between ET and IT and OT. And this then gets back to our digital natives with the, the, the hard part has been creating that frame of reference, the same 3D frame of reference for <coughs> IT and OT and ET, and who knows what the mobile devices will look like for our digital engineering models, for asset performance modeling, for and attracting our digital natives going forward. Thank you for your interest, and we have time for some questions. Yes, please. Greg, it looks like you're doing something really needed, which is to drastically reduce the cost of making the models. How far down have you gotten, and how much lower do you think you can get? In cost. Well, 
so I, I uh, was in a um, room like this in the UK last week. We've introduced this context capture is the software. It's very affordable software. It costs what a desktop software costs. It processes your digital photographs into that reality mesh while you're waiting. And so the room was full of people who had been trying. And I asked them, I said, I have a thick skin, I'm here to learn, How, how's it working? They all said, better than we possibly could have, ima could have imagined, even if we just use our smartphone to create the photograph. The qu you might say, what precision can you get? It just depends on how many photographs you take and what is it, the resolution <coughs> of your camera. But, but the, you saw the number it took to do that substation. So really, there can be a 3D model for every brown field. And what I think is that continuous survey because it doesn't need to be done by specialists occasionally mm -hmm. and expensively, we'll, we'll create all kinds of uses for that information, when especially it's geo-coordinated with all the other information, because now you have that common interface that everyone can experience to find the rest of the data. The rest of the data has been there somewhere, but now it can be geo-coordinated. The reason I showed the video recognition and so forth is the, the processing the video Software can recognize what is where. When it knows that, geo positions it, and it can continually update it then every time you refresh your survey. So all of us have seen point clouds and laser scanning, and that was great to start with, mm -hmm. but it requires mm -hmm. special equipment, <coughs> special crews, and you can do it every few years. With and the it drone was that will be part of every maintenance force, you can do it every week or as often as you'd like. And imagine your job is inspection. A lot of us worry that our inspectors are, are going to be retiring, the ones who have the mm -hmm. insights and so forth. The last thing you can afford to do is have them driving for hours in their day to find a site. Use the technology of the drone at the plant site, indoors or outdoors, by the way, both work well. You just need some lighting indoors uh, for photography. And then the, the inspector can sit at his desk. But unlike looking through photographs, where everyone is from a different angle, different time of day, the sun is different, and so forth. When you, when you triangulate it into this reality mesh, you always positionally look at exactly, if something's been corroding, you look at it today, and then you click, 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 a month ago, a year ago, two years ago, and, and can infer what the action should be. So I think it makes this very affordable. It's the reason I think asset performance modeling for all, it, the, it doesn't even require that you have a 3D model for engineering. You can still work with your schematics, bring in all your other uh, IT and OT uh, as a point of departure. So we, we always tell the story of the people who have everything, South Australia water. It's, it's the rest of us who, who don't need to wait now for these benefits. Tick. So w would it be fair to say that what this really does over point cloud modeling, which is confined to a fixed uh, rotating laser piece of equipment or something like this, some kind of reading, where th this expands the scope almost beyond wh whatever you can do in terms of whether it's drones flying around using the ordinary digital photograph. <coughs> I could even imagine this could be as expansive as satellite photography. Well, we, uh, well it, it started with satellite photography. Right. That was the original, right. the city model. <coughs> the so in China, all of the big cities for Tencent, which is their Google over there, are using this software to create 3D city models from aerial photograph from aerial photography and, and from satellite photography. So, so I think of <coughs> cameras being mobile, but we, we're thinking of today's cameras. Uh, in, in an industrial setting, you could afford to embed the cameras, you know, so that they're mm -hmm. cons constantly video imaging. And, and and you know, when a when a camera is moving, you auto, you automatically get in the video the sequence to triangulate that, that you need to create the. 3D mesh, it's aero triangulation is the, is the technology. But if you can put multiple cameras in place in your plant, and I hope when I see you next year, you'll have software that will show you where to put the cameras, to, to have the fewest of them and get the most overlap and, and, and have the most uh, valuable and useful <coughs> bootstrap your 3D modeling environment. But where it pays off is because that comes right into your engineering environment. The engineering environment is a 3D digital <coughs> environment. Finally, they're the same. That's the that's the bridge that's been necessary for this convergence. Thank you. I, I suspect we're out of time and need to turn over to the next group. But thank you for your interest. See you. If we have a booth. You can come and see this presentation. It's slower. Uh, <laughs> and, 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 and I'll be glad to take your questions. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you.